All right. Well, welcome everybody back from the lunch break. And for those of you in Zoom, I, again, I apologize for the tech archons we had earlier, but everything seems to be running smooth. So very excited for our next presentation. And I know you'll be able to uh, relate because it is a continuation of what we've been doing this morning. So uh, with us today, as I always say on the podcast, we've got the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? I'm fine. Glad to be virtually here. Sorry, I couldn't make it in person, but my saucer's in the shop. Somebody stole the cataclysmic converter. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody's very excited. And afterwards, we will have questions from, we'll start with the physical audience and then see if everybody in the Zoom has any questions. We'll try to get to your questions about Vance's presentation. Well, as I always say, enough of my dribble. Vance, I'm going to walk off your virtual reality and let you be the demiurge. Take us away. Okay, here we go, Miguel. Here we go. Welcome, everyone, to Gnostic Euphoria. So I'll start with a joke, like everybody likes to do in presentations. What do you get when you cross the Demiurge with a UFO pilot? Anybody got any ideas? I can't hear your answers, so I'll have to answer myself. I don't know, but it sure likes a good barbecue. <laughs> Here we go, barbecue. So, I don't think I have to tell everybody why UFOs and aliens are connected with Gnosticism, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Miguel and Lawrence did a fantastic job at explaining those connections, but I'm going to take you a little bit further in and to the side. Um, why would be interested in UFOs? Well, there's a connection between religion and culture and mythology. And I don't mean mythology is necessarily things that are false either. I'm talking about mythology, the stories of the past and the present. And uh, it's a way of exploring the esoteric world in a modern context with modern culture, the UFOs, the aliens, just as we had in the old days with angels and uh, demons and, and the demiurge and God and everybody else. Um, today, I'm going to explore a little bit about what parallel elements there are between UFOs, aliens, and Gnosticism. We're going to question the nature of reality, as we always do. And um, we're in good company because the none other than Carl Jung, who most of you uh, are very familiar with, at least uh, on, the, uh, on a uh, medium level, um, he was interested in Gnosticism and UFOs, plus tying in psychology and myths. So we're in good company. In fact, here's a letter from Carl Jung. We don't have to read it, but basically he says that um, uh, he thinks this field is fascinating. He, he's not certain about their nature, and to this day, we really aren't certain about their nature. Some people think they are. Some people are not certain. But um, there's a psychological aspect of it, and it's so impressive, he says, that really one must think that the UFOs are, have some sort of reality. And he's followed up the literature. And remember, this is, we're talking the 50s, and there was a big, you know, presence of UFOs in the 50s, and there were big flaps, the one over Washington, D.C., and so forth, that many of you probably heard about it. At this point, when he wrote this letter, he wrote a book about it, a booklet about it. Um, so that is Carl Jung's concept and opinion of UFOs. So many, many religions these days, and you know, last 20, 30, 40 years, have had a UFO component to them. So there's a, there's a good, uh, you know, there's a good tie in between Gnostics and since it's kind of a religion or it was a religion back in the day, and some people still think it is. Um, Scientology had 
the Thetans and Xenu and the volcanoes and the Xenu would steal the souls. And, and there's a big mythology in back of Scientology. It's not really advertised on the, you know, on the front sign, but once you get into it, um, and I think some of you probably have seen this yourselves, um, there, there is that component to Scientology. Uh, Uranus is one of the, the most uh, visually uh, interesting uh, space brother channeling UFO religions. Um, Ruth Norman, who is the most notable spokesperson of Uranus, uh, he, she claimed to talk to a lot of people in the past, including Nikola Tesla, and they had a kind of a scientific bent to them. And she called herself Uriel the Archangel. Uh, the Etheria Society, a guy named George King, here again, channeled uh, with aliens and cosmic masters. Makes you think of theosophy, right? Um, and they instructed him to found the Aetherius Society or to help mankind. And, you know, Uranus was uh, into that too. And Scientology figures they're helping people also. Realism, a French-based UFO religion, said aliens created humanity. That's not the first we'll, uh, uh, that's not the last we'll hear about that concept in this talk. Um, Alien human hybrids are the prophets in realism. Um, we all know about Heaven's Gate and the Hale Bop Comet. When Hale Bop came along, the people in Heaven's Gate decided it was going to go along with it. And the way they figured they could go there is to leave this mortal coil, literally. So obviously they're now defunct, but Hale Bop was a UFO to them. <clears throat> now, here's a surprise. I didn't know this. Falun Gong, which is a persecuted religion in China, um, they believe in aliens that invade human minds and corrupt people. And also, hold on to your hat and your phones and your computers. They think the aliens, the evil aliens, invented computers. So watch out. Next time you see uh, your phone or your computer, you can think... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Falun Gong uh, demons are are are, uh, are uh, hanging around your computer. Here's another surprise: the Nation of Islam believes that the Ezekiel UFO from the Bible, you know, the wheels within wheels, and combined with the Jewish Merkaba, um, the mother wheel made the universe. And Elijah Muhammad was the founder of Nation of Islam, and they believe he's still aboard it. When he died, he went aboard the UFO, and he's still up there directing things ostensibly, kind of like Heaven's Gate. And uh, the, now Church of the Subgenius, I'll show you a little bit about them later on. Now, here's an actual Gnostic religion, at least in my opinion. And it's, it's kind of a, a parody religion. It's funny. Uh, it's very creative. And it has a lot of Gnostic concepts built into it. So uh, the guy, Ivan Stang, who uh, founded it, along with a lot of other creative artists, probably had Gnosticism as well as other things in mind. Now, the, here's the big one. The big religion, and you'll never guess this one, which is based on, or at least uh, uh, owes a lot to UFOs, is Christianity, at least the Roman version. I'll give you a second to catch your breath there, <laughs> if you can believe it. Christianity, yes. Why? Well, Constantine, Constantine the Great, on the night of a battle that he's going to have with, I forget the guy's name, started with an M. Um, he, they were going to fight each other over who is going to be the emperor of Rome. And the night before this big battle, Constantine saw a great cross of light shining brightly. That was in 312 AD. <clears throat> and the sign in the sky said, in hoc signo vinces, which means by this sign you will conquer. So that night, when he went to bed, he also had a dream, a follow-up dream, which told him to use the Cairo sign on his soldier's shields. Now, see this um, this P and X sign here in the middle? That is um, that is the Cairo. And uh, to this day, I believe the uh, Roman Catholics use that as a sign for Christ. And that's really what, what, this, what this means. So he went on to battle. He's the one who changed Rome to um, stop 
carrying on. I guess the uh, archons didn't like what I just revealed about Christianity. Here's a little bit of a um, video on Unarius. I think you'll enjoy this. For the first time, I knew I was meeting a master. She emanated this love vibration that is indescribable. She would look you in your eyes and you knew she was beaming light into you. It was better than any meditation or any drug I'd ever had. It was a beautiful altered state of consciousness. And there she is. Did you guys see the video okay? Check it on tech. Yep, good. All right. So there she is, Ruth Norman. Yep, channeled, channeled the people from the stars. You notice a constant element we have here of beings from the stars, in the stars, either gods or aliens or whatever. And the Gnostics had their own version of that, of course, which is, you know, the aeons in the Pleroma. Okay, I mentioned the subgeniuses before. Um, is it a joke? Is it, or, or, or is a religion posing as a joke, or is a joke posing as religion? Well, they had a lot of Gnostic elements to them. Uh, they have uh, the X day where you can get uh, raptured and taken up by the saucer people. Um, and uh, the members, if you join up, and by one of their memberships, they are sure to spot on the Exus UFO ships at the end of the world. J.R. Bob Dobbs is their savior, as opposed to Jesus Christ. He's the guy with the pipe there. Uh, they decry the conspiracy, which is equivalent to the orthodoxy that the uh, Gnostics had to face. They call them the pinks. Um, they're into entheogens, or something called FROP which is not marijuana, it's just called FROP. It's Habas of FROP Zipulops. It's kind of a mythical antheogen. And uh, they're related to the Discordians and uh, Devo and everything. Um, um, here's some of their literature. Now, here you go. Jehovah is an alien and still threatens this planet. Now, who does that sound like? <laughs> this is why... Uh, and one of the first clues that I had that they were uh, a Gnostic-oriented uh, uh, parody, humorous religion. The world ends tomorrow and you may die. Or are we controlled by secret forces? Well, there we go. What did Lawrence just talk about? Right? The secret for the alien space monsters who want to bring a startling new world. There you go. Jehovah One. And here they are. Besides his own exaggerated human nature and the powers granted him by Jehovah One, Bob also benefits from being the chosen broker on Earth for superior beings from the furthest reaches of known space, the so-called men from planet X, or Xists, for they are nothing like men. Bob has a covenant with these angelic beings, a cosmic contract, a deal. On July 5th, 1998, at 7 a.m., the Exists shall make a mass landing on this planet. The children of Bob shall be rewarded at this foretold rupture, this day of judgment, when all those who paid their church dues will be lifted up in power and glory to gain new homes and bodies aboard the pleasure saucers of the sex goddesses. All the while watching the hapless pigs twitch and bleat and wail in the death throes of their world. And we faithful shall be transfigured into new enlightened beings, superior mutants called overmen and uberwomen, who will start a new Jerusalem in the promised land of Dimension X, Asgard, 
the zone of internal slack and cytorspasmic ooze squirt. Behold my servant Sean Rosper. He got exalted and lifted up on the pipe. Shall be very high. He knoweth the fools who prophesy for him. He shall be made over him. Many will be astonished at him for his appearance is so high beyond the human semblance that his form is beyond that of the sons of God. <laughs> we can't do much about those evil gods from the other side of the cosmos who fly through the air and through the nebulous darkness of space. Space, my friends, the infinite inky clouds of nebulae. They fly on their membranous leathery wings, holding in their coiling tentacles shiny steel cylinders, each one containing what was once a human soul, what was once a member of the Church of the Subgenius. But enough of this. You don't want to hear about this. I must, and yet I cannot. I, but I, I'll tell you what, you'll be wishing it was that kind of hate. At least you'll be wishing, you'll be glad to have them on your side. Because at least they have a head. At least there's two arms and two legs. There could, it could be worse. It could be much worse. Well, I should give you a second to uh, shake your heads uh, from the, that devival, as they call it. <laughs> and uh, it, it really looks crazy, and it really is crazy. But, you know, what are the ideas of every saucer religion or maybe most religions are they crazy who's to say um here's a bunch of people that were associated with the subgeniuses uh, robert anton wilson who we've uh, a lot of us have heard of robert crumb of course the uh, the underground cartoonist ken kesey the inventor of the hippies paul rubens um uh, otherwise known as Wee urban mark mothersbaugh and gerald casals from devo Frank Zappa and Penn Jillette, that, was, that last one I didn't know about until I did this presentation. So that's the subgeniuses, um, mostly put in here to just kind of give you a chuckle, but as you can see, there's Gnostic elements to it. Um, they're rebelling against the Khan. So back to more serious discussions of UFO religions. Here's a bunch of books that people have taken the trouble to write. Um, one of them is by uh, someone that's been on the show before, uh, Diane Pasolka, American Cosmic. Uh, she talked about the book on the show. Go back and uh, past shows if you have access to them and uh, take a listen if you're interested. Here's one on Heaven's Gate. Um, here's one on UFO religions uh, in general. In fact, two of them. And the Heavenly Lights, the Apparitions of Fatima. That's right. F Fatima too. Fatima. Our Lady of uh, Lourdes, a lot, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, Virgin Mary apparitions may not have been the Virgin Mary at all, but some kind of alien aeon, who knows? And here's a textual version of the slide you just saw. In case you want to take down the authors, you want to read up on these. Okay, let's get a little deeper into this. What are the differences? Well, what's Gnosticism, first of all? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a definition of Gnosticism, <clears throat> like a lot of people do. First of all, it was heretical compared to the orthodoxy of the day. Um, and so is UFOs. There's a lot of persecution that has been uh, uh, thrusted upon people that are interested or believe in UFOs and aliens and so forth. They're ridiculed. Uh, until recently, now the U.S. government has come out and said, well, there's something to it after all. So, but before that, they, um, they said, oh, there's no such thing. It's all swamp gas. You, you've heard it all. Um, the Gnostics believed that the god of the material world was Demiurge. That's one of the prime characteristics. And, um, and the Archons were kind of his employees or his minions. And that there was a god above that god, 
with Jesus as an emissary, you know, the logos, you know, the head eon or whatever. Um, knowledge was the key to salvation, not obedience to the law. I should say, you know, these are characteristics, not a definition, really. Um, you follow your inner voice rather than the external authority. Like you could think of the government telling you UFOs are crazy as the external authority and your inner voice being, hey, your experience or just your intuition. Um, Gnostics believed in Pleroma, the fullness region of light associated with the skies. Um, feminine, divine feminine. The Gnostics embraced femininity as opposed to the Orthodox Christianity of the day. To this day, many Christian faiths still don't allow um, ordination of females. Uh, the Gnostics believed in a more egalitarian se uh, setup. Um, they were subjects to the polemic. They were subject to the polemics, Arrhenius being an example. So this is all reminiscent of the UFO um, phenomenon. Uh, because anybody who's against the authorities gets the same kind of treatment. For example, like I said, belief in UFOs was heretical and ridiculed until recently. Um, the aliens are considered to be superior to humans. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have all this technology, right? Superior knowledge, superior powers. How they use that differs. But um, um, it is a characteristic that is uh, in common with the heavenly of the uh, more traditional religions. Some aliens pose as saviors. Well, we have plenty of saviors. <laughs> the Gnostics had uh, Jesus, the Logos, and Sophia, and uh, the Orthodoxy had saviors too. So that's something they, they shared. It's just different, different kinds of saviors or different viewpoint. Um, <clears throat> the saving of mankind, the, the salvific um, aspect. The aliens are here, some of them, to save mankind. Some of them are here to take over the planet, of course, too, according to some people. But, uh, and that, of course, you could look at the um, archons as wanting to take over the planet or feeling they own it and maintain their take over the planet. Um, aliens transcend the earthly uh, authorities. They don't go up to the president. And they don't, you know, open a an embassy and send diplomats, they go directly to the people. So um, that is really the case uh, in the ancient religions, all the ancient religions, really. But Gnosticism specifically with the personal element of it. Um, the sky is a common element. Um, other dimensions is an addition in our modern time, since we're starting to understand such things, but their home is the stars. Um, there are female aliens, there are male aliens. Sometimes they're considered as not being either one. And UFOs subject to debunking, just like the Gnostics were. Amazing Randy, Carl Sagan, you know, all sorts of people. Um, don't believe it. It can't be. They won't even consider the evidence because it's just too ridiculous to consider evidence. And that don't convince me of, uh, you know, my my opinion is still my opinion. And don't confuse me with the facts. So now, in truth, aliens may not be what we call aliens may not be astronauts in, in the sense that, you know, the 1960s, where we were sending men up into space. Uh, Jacques Vallée wrote a book called Passport to Magonia, uh, which makes the argument that the people in the UFOs and aliens may not be spaceships in the literal sense. They might be something else. Strange beings have been recorded throughout history, fairies, monsters, elves, demons, angels, and um, maybe aeons, archons. I don't know. Do we have any aeon sightings? I think some people have had them in visions, um, either in modern times or in the uh, old times when Gnosticism was uh, prevalent uh, the, in the ancient Gnosticism. Uh, arena. So it pays to keep an open mind because the, what does the alien really mean? It means different than our ordinary uh, human beings. That's really what it means. And beyond that, we really don't know very much about the phenomenon. So otherworldly. That's what aliens are from another world. That's really what we're talking about with all this stuff. 
the big argument being, are we alone? Is this the only world where intelligent conscious beings exist? Or are there other worlds? That's the real difference between, you know, people that are materialists and people that are quote unquote spiritual. And that's one of the biggest tie-ins between Gnosticism and UFOs and aliens and other religions, to tell you the truth. So um, Dylan Burns, another guest that we've had on the show, uh, wrote a book about the alien god. And of course, as you know, um, we talk about the alien god and Gnosticism because the alien god is not from this world. In fact, not really from this universe. He emanates the universe. Now, the Gnostics had this concept that there are at least two worlds or two major categories of worlds, the Pleroma, which means fullness, and the Kanoma, which is means void. So the Gnostics, at least some of them, felt that this world was really a void. And, um, and we were, um, you know, the Demiurge created it. It was a shadow. Remember Carl, uh, Carl Jung and Plato? Remember Plato with the cave and the shadows? Yeah, that, that the Kanoma was a shadow world that was based on the Pleroma, but it was kind of like a cheap copy. So now here's an interesting thing. In Orthodox Christianity, heaven and earth, you could say, well, heaven and earth, that's two worlds. But in Orthodox Christianity, heaven was not for mortals. There are a couple of mortals that went up there. In fact, Enoch, Enoch, Elijah, eight other ones that are measured, uh, that are mentioned in the Midrash also. Um, but by and large, mortals, when they die, didn't go to heaven. They went into a limbo or a nowhere state, a void, you know, a total, you know, a limbo. And at the end of the world, at the apocalypse, as told in Revelation, um, God brings heaven to earth and merges, and it's still one world. Now, they said there was a heaven, but it's not something that humans would ever see until heaven was made synonymous with earth. Now, that is not the view of the Gnostics. The Gnostics felt that um, when we left this mortal coil, we would go through several levels and we'd have to go through the archons and get past them, give them passwords and so forth. And then we could rejoin the God above God, the one, the monad in the uh, Pleroma and, and, into the actual reality. So that's a little bit different. So that's something to think about when we're talking about Gnostics and the aliens. It's more like, you know, the alien abductions when people get taken up in the ships. And here's one of the ships. <laughs> well, this is actually an artist rendering of the Ezekiel UFO, the wheels within wheels. You can see the different wheels spinning around. It reminds you of Contact. Remember the machine in Contact? That was the wheels within wheels too. Got to remember... Uh, these people that write the movies and the artists that uh, design the effects in the movies uh, actually are influenced by these concepts. So this reminds me of perhaps another otherworldly vehicle. And the way it's described in Ezekiel in the Bible, it can be interpreted that way. So again, even the Old Testament had uh, images of UFOs. As, as we probably most of you probably know. And here's another UFO. There's Jehovah in his little chariot there. Now, the Greeks had Apollo riding a chariot in the sun. So the Greeks had people kind of riding around. In fact, all the planets are named after gods. So are these aliens? You could think of gods, the Greek gods and the polytheistic religions as aliens if they were associated with the sky. Here's a wheel within wheel again, down at the lower right. And this must be Moses receiving the Ten Commandments here. He's getting a telegram or something. <laughs> Could be anyone that's getting a message from God. Just as the aliens give messages to people. Now, this may be just a coincidence, but the left-hand picture is a picture of the crowd at uh, Fatima during the miracle of the sun where the sun was seen to be wandering around in the sky 
well, we know the sun really can't wander around the sky, so they must have been seeing something else. And so I would call that a UFO. And it was a spiraling kind of apparition. And to the right, we have the Norway spiral, which was, it really wasn't flying, it kind of developed. And I guess it was a Russian missile, but I thought that was interesting, interesting uh, coincidence here. That there were the signs in the sky, spirals. In fact, when I was young, I used to have dreams about spirals in the sky. And they were my some of my most favorite dreams. And just as Gnosticism had many variations, so do the vehicles or the, the way they project, the aliens project themselves into the world. The aliens seem to be able to defy the laws of physics. And that's kind of consistent with someone that's not confined to the material laws like uh, like aeons would be. And um, if you've got a favorite shape, they've got a saucer for you. Give you a second to peruse this. This one, this one, one of these here seems to have a certificate, <laughs> authenticity certificate. I, and there's the black triangle, by the way, on the lower left, you'll see the black triangle, which were, um, which were seen uh, at, at Belgium. And there really are authentic UFO sightings. A lot of them aren't maybe, but there are authentic UFO sightings. And we have to wonder what these are. They're certainly not ordinary human as we know um, in common knowledge today. Here's some of the way the aliens are said to look. Now, the one of them that fascinates me is there's a cat, but she's from Sirius. She goes, these are Syrians. So I'm wondering how cats would fare on the dog star. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's amazing how many different images. And we have many different appearances of angels in, uh, in, in lore. Uh, sometimes they're human looking. Sometimes they look like that weird thing I showed you with all the wheels. Um, many different um, appearances. So many different appearances of UFOs too. We can't really say what they are, they're mysterious. The Belgian Triangle here appears up the upper right. Now the up at the lower right, we have, these are actual UFOs that the US government has released. These are some of the real, um, the real snaps that the, the, that the government took, I think the US Navy. The Phoenix Lights on the lower left, and on the upper upper uh, left, we have um, the uh, the Tic Tac UFOs that I'll show you a video of in a moment. And my favorite UFO that my grandmother had in her um, Major Donald Kehoe book, uh, the Project Blue Book. Um, that that was the one, the first UFO I ever laid eyes on. Here's the. Um, Here's the government footage, I promise you. Uh, Lawrence showed some stills from this before. Now you'll see um, uh, an another picture live. In the language of the US Department of Defense, these are unidentified aerial phenomena, videos which add fuel to the belief of that's some that's 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 we are not alone. The first incident was filmed off the California coast in 2004, an oval shape hovering and in the words of the Navy pilot who recorded this, not behaving by the normal laws of physics. Oh, that's no, is it? It's not. Well, if there's a good thing, have a look on the In 2015, pilots flying off the east coast of America spotted this. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. Again, its speed and movement apparently astounding experienced air crew. It's not. Well, if there's a good thing, it's rotated. That same year, racing across the surface of the ocean, something that it took some skill to capture. <laughs> All of these videos have been leaked in the past, but the US government now confirms they are genuine. So there's a um, little bit of UFO uh, lore for you just to get you in, in, into the mood and into the mindset of UFOs. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of 
pictures from the Gnostics themselves or that are, that the Gnostics used of the star creatures and the UFOs and so forth. At least I couldn't find uh, uh, many that are specifically Gnostic. But we, of course, if Abraxas isn't an, an alien, I don't know who is. I mean, who else has snakes for legs and a chicken head? So rides around in a chariot. Pretty cool. So he's uh, definitely airborne. He's uh, sky capable. And of course, the snake with the lion head, which is a symbol of the demiurge. Here's a nice colorized version for you of the uh, one that you usually see in black and white on the medallion. Um, definitely an alien. Talking snakes and so forth, definitely aliens by our definition today. We're just using different words for the same otherworldly beings and creatures that, that converse with us and try to tell us various things. Here's some other ones that th these are, these are pretty much uh, these are pretty much uh, exposed on uh, you know the ancient aliens shows and so forth. You've seen these many times, no doubt. But uh, up up at the upper left and the upper right, you can see the um, the creatures that are that are in these vehicles that are flying through the skies. Now they were said to be gods or whatever, but you know gods in a crucifixion thing. I thought there was only one god. Well, there's somebody somebody's taking a look at it so here's a close-up of these guys and they're the way that where they are is up there and up here here's another one they've done the work for me here here's a guy that with his little dog down here Love this little dog looking up there. He's looking out. This is if this isn't a vehicle, I don't know what is. Some sort of vehicle or presence. Uh, one of my uh, theories is that they're they're little. Uh, they're the tips of like a microscope that's watching us. That like scans across and looks at what's going on down here. Kind of probes or sensors. This is what they look like in our vision, but in their vision, who knows what it looks like? They might be sitting in a console or something. Well, there are differences between angels and aliens, um, but there are similarities. For example, okay, they're not humans. Superior knowledge, as I mentioned before, they inhabit the skies. They can fly. Some of them look like humanoids. Uh, lumin luminosity is another characteristic. Luminous. Now, that's something that's uh, well known in ancient lore and mythology, so forth, the glowing nature. Uh, the, the halos and so forth. Uh, not always friendly. If you read about the angels in the Bible, they're not always friendly. They're here to deliver a message. And if the message isn't good, you know, that's that's that. And if you don't entertain them, if you go, if an angel comes to your house and you don't treat them well, you're in big trouble. So you could say there's evil aspects and good aspects and that same is true of aliens there are some aliens that are evil they abduct they do experiments on people they're said to breed with them and there's some that are good that want to tell us to save the planet and don't pollute it and, and all sorts of good messages now on the other hand um, angels are not supposed to lack free will they're just doing the will of god or the demiurge whichever you uh, pick if you're gnostic uh, they're doing the will of the demiurge they're just archons that are sent down um, details of appearance vary greatly, um, although there's some overlap. Um, most of them are associated with flying in vehicles, but uh, but the aliens are specifically associated with UFOs, although that might be a cultural thing. And um, in the uh, in the ancient times, even in Gnostics, there's kind of a hierarchy. You know, there's the God above God, then there's the Archon, uh, the, a the Aeons, and the Aeons have kind of a structure, and then uh, the different levels of Aeons. And uh, the same is true in Orthodoxy. Um, there is a structure, there's God, and then there's the angels, or the God and Jesus together in the Holy Spirit. Then there's the angels, and so forth. And, and even the quote-unquote devil or, or Satan is an angel. He's just like the bad angels. And so we have the good and bad angels. And we have archangels and normal angels. So there's a hierarchical um, nature, more so in orthodoxy. Uh, but the aliens don't seem to have very much of a hierarchy, except the greys are said to have 
the little ones are like kind of like robots and then there's larger grays that seem like they might be uh, more sentient so other than that there's not much evidence of a, of a hierarchy with with aliens jesus well jesus is definitely a mixture of human because he had a human form everybody agrees on that and divine now whether or not he was actually just appearing to be human or he was actually human is up for debate as you know um the concept of jesus and the con is different in gnosticism and orthodoxy um some people say that jesus was a channeler now in ufo and alien lore a lot of people claim to channel aliens so there's a concept of human beings acting as the mouthpiece for the greater um the greater uh, presence and certainly even orthodoxy says that and um in gnosticism i think the predominant opinion was that um all of us can achieve what jesus achieved if we were you know clear enough if we you know shook the dust of the kenoma off ourselves uh and we could it's that connection like lawrence was saying in his talk earlier the connection with the one the monad that we we are and um that's what i believe uh, that, that jesus what was about so that's kind of what people that are allegedly channeling channeling aliens are doing so there's a connection there uh aliens are said to heal people upon occasion so truly the whole alien ufo thing is basically a religion if you look at all these different characteristics Um, here's some of the examples, you know, aliens created human humanity, um, kind of like a, uh, in um, Sumerian uh, literature with Enlil and Enki. Um, the aliens need human DNA to survive. Well, that's more like the archons. Now, the archons need something from us to survive, right? They need they feed off of something that we have. Fear is a very popular uh, theory as far as what they're getting from us or maybe um we are the way they affect things physically in the world since we don't see anything directly you know very few people have actually seen archons go around the planet even aliens don't seem to affect things now there is a story about the aliens hovering over missile silos and deactivating or sometimes in russia it was even activating um the uh, the nuclear missiles and there are stories about the aliens taking energy from power lines. So, but by and large, they're most of the stories that the aliens are not affecting anyone directly. Um, the good ones, as I said before, say they're here to save us from self-destructions. Sometimes they want to share their technology. At least um, there's a theory that the UFO crashes are actually staged. Um, Colonel Philip Corso who was um, in the Army Air Force, um, claims that he was um, assigned to a project to take the crashed pieces recovered from UFO crashes and um, back engineer them by going to various corporations around the planet, mostly the United States, and have them develop things like transistors and lasers and um, infrared vision and things like that. Um, are claimed to have come from alien technology. Now, the bad ones want to wipe the humanity off the earth and take over the planet. Tell you the truth, if they wanted to do it, I think they would have done it by now. Uh, one of my favorite theories, whoops, didn't want to do that, is that the aliens are gardeners who want to cultivate life. They're like, they're the gardeners. They want to like uh, clip out the weeds and so forth. So they better do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> weeding out uh, the earth and making uh, making the garden nice that goes back to the garden of eden right that they uh that, uh, that we started out as a garden and then the garden uh got thrown out so are aliens demons or aliens angels we don't know it sounds like all of the above now science hasn't been mentioned yet 
scientific revolution changed our whole outlook on religion. I think that's the start and that's what led up to the current manifestation of these otherworldly beings on the planet because it changed our culture. We went from a religious culture. Remember, religion was the was the way that um, uh, literacy was spread throughout the world. Um, all the original institutions religiously based because that's who had the power, who had the money. But now the um, secular society has taken that over. And so the UFOs and aliens now are manifesting in a materialistic way. It's about the view of reality. How do we see reality? But if you dig down all the debunking of UFOs and aliens and so forth, because we know our science tells us that, you know, it can't be, they can't be from the stars. Well, maybe not, maybe, maybe not. But uh, when we study physics deeply enough, we see that we have a lot to learn about. We don't really know the basis of what we think is the material world. The Kenoma might not really exist the way we think it does and certainly doesn't exist the way we perceive it. Which brings us to um, the recent admissions about UFOs. Well, what's happening? Is, is the better version, the more refined version of reality sinking in finally into society? The simulation theory discussions that are going on? Uh, serious ones, you know, from from scientists, not just from, you know, armchair amateur people that are having theories of their own. Every, you know, people that are studied and know the scientific aspects of things are, you can't prove that we're not in a simulation. So who controls the simulation is the big question, right? Now, one of my favorite things to think about is how are physical laws implemented how, how are they maintained throughout all of space and time how is this consistency this is really what creates our universe is is the is the rules the laws i mean if things didn't work the way they did consistently it would be chaotic and we probably couldn't be conscious beings existing here but the ufos seem to defy those laws which makes you think that they are above the material what we call material universe. So the Gnostic concept of the Demiurge creating a false world is very temptingly uh, connected with simulation theory, creating shadow world. So whoever created the, um, the universal simula simulation, so to speak, probably did so with a reference of their own universe which reminds me of God created man in his own image, right? Well, maybe that's like, that's, that's what's happening. Plato's cave I mentioned before the cave is the simulation and all the shadows are the, the things that we see, but the knowledge, the, um, uh, which again brings us to Gnostics is the reality behind the cave above the cave up on the surface where the sun shines. And that's what sets us free. So as Gnostics, we're looking to see that knowledge that'll set us free, that'll get us to rise above the cave and getting to us. And who knows, hopefully the aliens, or at least some of them, or angels or whatever they are, are going to help us. In fact, Gnostics believe that the aeons do help us. And it's really true. There, um, one of our guests, Bernardo Castro, describes the way our minds work as creating a model of reality and we're actually looking at a dashboard as if we're flying a plane on instruments we can't see outside the windows but we see the dashboard the light the sound the touching um the odors you know the olfactory sense they're all like instruments that we're uh, probing the universe with and that's literally true we can we can pretty much prove that what's the reality behind it though and by now, yeah, you've heard me say this again and again, are the aliens, are they the Archons? Um, there was a documentary back in 2004, I believe, about uh, the alien gods. <clears throat> um, ancient astronaut theory, you've seen, I mean, the uh, uh, um, ancient aliens is all about this, about the ancient astronaut theory. And the 12th planet book, Enlil, the friendly guy, Enki, the unfriendly. 
um, Enlil was like a, a um, he was like a um, uh, Promethean figure who wanted to help humanity, like some of the aliens are said to. So here we are, the God and the alien, um, uh, the connection. And the Anunnaki, Nibiru, the, the other, the 12th planet, it's coming, they say. I haven't seen it yet, but people say that it's here. So, in the end, what do what can we make of all this? What's the connection between Gnosticism and aliens? Well, you can see Gnosticism as you know, in the form of a religion, in the form of a set of beliefs, in the form of a set of uh, knowledge, is really has a lot in common with the religions that it came from, Platonism being one of them, by the way, and. Um, and it has a lot in common with with the UFO and alien phenomenon. And really, in the end, I think we're going to understand that it's all wrapped up in the same thing. We're just trying to discover what our origins are, what's our very nature. And the aliens and the UFO give us a, a way to look at that. It's another path to look at it. So I don't think people should be making fun of people who say they're abducted or say they see UFOs or whatever. It gets us to think. It's a wake-up call, like an alarm clock. We want to think that someone cares. And so anything that maintains our social coherence, that defines right and wrong so we don't hurt each other, so we can survive with others on the planet, to me is a good thing as long as we don't hurt, hurt each other. And so I don't think the aliens, have, um, or at least most of them, have hurt anyone, except for the cows, I suppose. <laughs> Hopefully those aliens are being kept at bay by the other ones. But in the end, we all love a mystery. And so UFOs um, and the alien phenomenon really sparks our imaginations and um that's what we Gnostics are all about. So that is my presentation. And now I will entertain questions. I need to hear the audio. Anybody got any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Testing. Can you hear me, Vance? Yep, I can hear you now. All right. You got a, a nice standing ovation. Oh, thank you, everyone. So, yeah, great presentation. Any questions from the audience? Do you see people in the chat who might want to are asking questions or raising hands? Uh, yeah, okay. Do we have another microphone? Yeah, there's a room mic somewhere. Oh. All right, Nate's going to ask a question. Hi, Nate. Hey. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Vance. Um, great presentation. Hi. Thank you. My quick question for you is, um, so according to the work of Dark Journalist, which is featured Gigi Young, um, who says, uh, Dark Journalist, according to whom there is land rising in this Cancun area, so he's calling it the hot zone, so it's relevant to this area. My question for you is that he advocates avoiding using the term UAP because the way that it sets the premise is that it's a threat. And I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on this, comparing what you just talked about, especially how it's kind of make it sound like it's a filter, like the way we choose to see it. So I wanted you to comment on the uh, importance of how we approach this in the lens through which we look, because wouldn't that have everything to do with the healing that could come from it? That's my question. I hope that made sense. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in short, my opinion is, yes, terms, terminology is important. Now, unidentified flying object is a very objective term, but it's come to have a bad connotation. Oh, UFO is crazy, haha, -ha, and so forth. I think the government um, is using UAP because the fact that they themselves have ruined the UFO term. So now they want a, 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 aerial phenomenon. Well, it is in the air, except there's only one problem. It's also an oceanic phenomenon that goes under the sea. So I don't know. UAP 
to me doesn't have a negative connotation, but um, it might for some people. And certainly if the government is using it and wants to spin it a certain way, it might come to have a negative connotation. So well, I guess we'll have to see. Any questions, other questions from the audience? Any questions from the online Zoom audience? Yeah, we do have some. All right. I've been Let's waiting. Some of those out. Okay, I got to pick them out as we always do on Neon Byte Live. Are negative aliens instigating transhumanism? From John F. Um, yeah, I think so. You could say that the archons neg are equals negative aliens. Um, the transhumanism really is a, um, a form of materialism. And they want to convince you that there's nothing besides, you know, the mind is totally uh, epiphenomenon of the brain and so forth and so on. That is to limit you in, in a little box in your physical body. And when, when your meat machine dies, you die, right? So I think that's, uh, uh, that's probably what's going on with that. And they want to convince you that you can go and migrate into a machine, right? That, uh, yes, if, if we transmit your memories into a machine, then you will um, then you will be alive in the machine. But I don't think that's the way it's going to work. This might be a trick to get people to kill themselves. So that's the answer to that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Brielle says, if Syrians had a colony on the moon, they would be moon dogs. <laughs> That's true. Uh, do I believe that the ridiculing of the UFO phenomenon was deliberate and systematic? That's from Lori Johnson. Absolutely. Um, there's no question that the, uh, the government and the scientific establishment uh, has done that for years. I mean, from Roswell, Roswell 1947, uh, they came out with the actual story and then they quickly suppressed it and so there you know and you know J. Allen Hynek was originally one of those people that but and Project Blue Book was uh, deliberately created to suppress the stories and the ones that were um, in fact the Condon report is a good example the Condon report actually had a lot of unexplained sightings in it however the conclusion didn't match what was in the report it's because they knew people would by and large just read the conclusion and so the Condon report says nothing to it, nothing to see here. It's all swamp gas and uh, and and so forth. So yes, I believe that's the case. Okay, okay. Here's a good question from Aman. Um, why do we need a UFO alien paradigm? It seems very mechanistic, modern tech. Can we still engage with the Gnostic principles without this model? Well, we don't need it, and we can engage with Gnostic principles, but we do principles, but we need a model of some sort. And some people relate to the physical models better than the uh, than than the other more idealistic models and so forth, the philosophical models. So I think that everybody has got their own path, and um, a lot of people um, weren't interested in anything beyond the material until they saw UFOs, and so they're going to kind of ride that one out. Now, having said that. Um, the UFOs and aliens are kind of scant on in-depth material. Um, if well, unless you read some of these books that where they're channeling a lot, but and you get a lot of different messages. But hey, the same is true of you know the Gnostics. The Gnostics don't have necessarily a universal message, and uh, so we don't need we don't need it. But some people like it, and some people connect to you know beyond the material through it. Okay. And so Tommy H wanted uh, me to answer, what's my take on the Phalian hypothesis from Joshua Kuchin? I'm not familiar with it, so I don't have an answer for you there. And I believe anybody in the chat, did I miss anybody's question in the chat? Any other further questions from the audience? Yes, we have one. We have another question. Uh, where's the, Great. the errant microphone? There you go. It's coming. Yeah. Hey, Vance. Uh, you touched on the Fatima sighting. Yes. Um, can you, was there like prophecy associated with that uh, sighting? And can you touch on that a little bit? I've heard recently that, uh, I don't know, is that, is that something that, would, that you can respond to, I guess? 
a little bit. Um, in fact, it's a strange thing. A, um, who, a person who may be a relative of mine, Asachi, um, uh, is in Italy, and he's got this big thing going about the, the third um, prophecy of Fatima. And it's supposed to be a secret, and the church was supposed to uh, have revealed it by now and has not revealed it by now. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Mar Malachi Martin used to go on... Uh, um, coast to coast AM and and speak about this and he wouldn't he said he knew it but he wouldn't reveal it but it had something about uh, the church you know the Roman Catholic Church and um, the corruption within the church and um, beyond that um, Dr. Martin wouldn't say and I don't certainly know what the, what the prophecy was but it was um, kind of a kind of doom and gloom but it was oriented towards the church and kind of an end of the world thing and that's about all i really know about it uh just to put a cap on that i've heard part of that was like the the uh, roman catholic church consecrating the church of the uh, eastern Orthodox. russia yes and that, that happened recently like with yes weeks so anyways it's happened before actually uh, there uh i think in world war ii uh, the Pope consecrated um, the, the Russia to the uh, the Holy Mother, and so it has happened before. So it keeps happening, and people think that maybe the end of the world will then ensue or some horrible thing. And if you think about it, with World War II and the atom bombs going off, that was a real possibility. So maybe whatever was in this third um, secret of Fatima had something to do with uh, you know conflagration, a huge conflagration, and end of the world as we know it. But um, didn't happen in World War II, and here we are again. But then again, maybe that was maybe that reality ended, and now we're in another branch <laughs> of the multiverse. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? I don't see anybody from the Meat Sack audience or Meat Space audience. What about? Oh, the I got one from the chat here. Another one. What's my take on Dr. Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, and the CE5? protocol close encounters of the fifth kind um it's interesting i'll i'll give you a little revelation years and years ago i took a group of people up in the mountains over silicon valley because i thought we were going to have a ufo sighting just exactly like stephen greer does out in the deserts you know he brings people out in the desert or wherever he goes and and they um they do certain uh, meditations and and uh, they see the saucers they don't um i don't think they speak to them in a language um style thing but they signal to them they signal with lasers and flashlights and and uh and the, and the saucers rock back and forth and they have an experience um I'm undecided about it. I haven't experienced that myself. Uh, and my own uh, attempt at getting the UFOs was very disappointing because I took everybody up there and they didn't show up. So uh, what can I say? So I, um, but you know, I, I really do think there's something to it. I knew a couple of people from the Manhattan Project years ago. They're no longer with us, but um, they told me that they knew for sure that they well they saw ufos when they were on deployment on, on a on a ship and went right over the ship and they knew because they were associated with the um, high energy uh, photography and high speed photography that they they were doing in those days in fact the woman worked for wright patterson she was uh, in charge of the photo lab there um, that's what they said i wasn't there to prove it but i I have no reason to doubt what they said. They were very serious people. They weren't, you know, they lived up in the hills in San Jose. And uh, uh, they said they weren't anything that we had because they had footage of just about everything that flew in those days, at least. So I think they're real. There's enough evidence. And now the U.S. government's finally admitting that there's some reality, even though if we don't know what they are. So who's to say Stephen Greer and his uh, people that he brings out there aren't? Uh, and he has that disclosure project. Uh, some of you may have heard about that. He's had a lot of people from the government, the military, testify in front of Congress about the things that the government has not let out of the bag. Now, I don't think the government's going to let things out of the bag at this point. And now uh, 
Why is this Gnostic? Because we Gnostics want to know, don't we? We want to know. We want that knowledge, the knowledge that's not pulling the wool over our eyes. So there you go. Great answer. Well, if there are no other questions, then we'll wrap it up. Vince, uh, thanks for an amazing presentation and uh, good job as always. Uh, you got one more question. You want to do that? Yeah, sure. Tommy H. Do I reckon Falun Gong's magical work against computer demons resulted in Chris Knoll's Lucifer technology series? <laughs> Uh, well, you know what? I have no idea. I think we'll have to let Chris answer that one when he gets up there to speak. Chris just ran out the back door. I, mean, he knows, <laughs> I know he, he's been had. <laughs> okay, everybody. Hey, thank you all so very much. I enjoyed uh, giving this to you. Well, thank you very much, Vance. And uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And uh don't let them take you away tonight. Stay away from any moving beams. Okay, I'll be watching. All right, take care, Vance. Oh, I'm sure you'll be on Zoom uh, watching the rest of the presentation. So we'll see you. You then. bet. All right, take care.